Well, good morning, all. Good morning. And welcome to everyone and our guests. And we've got a special little guest here. What's the guest's name? Hedwig. 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 Where's Hedwig from? Um, what's that? Where's he from? Where's he from? Hingra. Hingra. Ah, that's alright. I come across this this morning as I was getting ready. It says, Good morning. This is God. I will be handling all your problems today. Please remember, I will not need your help. If life happens to deliver a situation to you that you cannot handle, do not attempt to resolve it. Kindly put it in the box, mark something for God to do. It will be addressed in my time, not yours. Once the matter is placed into the box, do not hold on to it. Holding on or removal will, will delay your problem. If the situation that you think you are capable of handling, please consult me in prayer first to be sure that it is the proper resolution. If you find yourself stuck in traffic, don't despair. There are people in this world whom driving is an unheard privilege. Should you have a bad day at work, think of a man who has been out of work for years. Should you despair over the relationship gone bad, think of the person who has never known what it's like to love or to love. Should you grieve the passing of another weekend, think of the woman in dire straits, working 12 hours a day, seven days a week, to feed her children. Should your car break down, leaving you miles from assistance, think of the par paralegic, paralegic who would love the opportunity to take that walk. Should you notice a new grey hair in the mirror? Think of the cancer patient, in chemo, who wishes they had her. Should you find yourself at a loss and pondering what is life all about? Ask what is my purpose? Be thankful there are those who didn't live long enough to get this opportunity. Should you find yourself a victim of other people's bitterness, ignorance, smallness or insecurities? Remember, things could be worse, you could be them. Because I do not sleep, nor do I slum slumber, there is no need for you to lose any sleep. Rest my child. If you need to contact me, on my need of prayer, I'll wait. Amen. I know the first Peter is doing the notice today. Yes, good morning and welcome. Yes, Carl, so he's leaving the service of Jan for the children. And then this evening, 6 pm, will be myself leaving the service. Tuesday, 7 pm, church meeting. I believe the agendas have been circulated by email. But if you uh, want to take one, or want to, sorry, if you want a hard copy, I've got some with me to see me after the service. Wednesday, 6.30 p.m. Boys Club. Thursday, 10 a.m. Coffee Hour. And then Friday, it says Girls Brigade at the Meadow. Then next Sunday, Sunday the 21st of July, it's a cold leave in the service, but it's Jam Anniversary. So uh, we'll be focusing perhaps on Jam next week. Perhaps we'll get some toast from Jen. <laughs> Sorry, she put this way there. <laughs> then in the evening, 6pm, we're expecting Charles Slutton to uh, lead the service and communion will be part of that service. You might just see a little note also about next Sunday, Pound Lane Mission Church, I think that's, or maybe Pitsy Way, that sort of thing. Yeah. There's, um, 
Paul Barnes has organised a little meeting for uh, his friend, or the man who runs the orphanage out in India, Joseph Paul, and uh, the time of uh, saying hello before he returns to India. And uh, yeah, so that's next Sunday at 4 pm, which I must say. Streets for Prayer, Conway Avenue, Coronation Clothes and Crouchman's Avenue. UEC Church to Remember and Prayers the one in London at Camberwell. Our missionary focus this week is the Gretchmans, Tim and Susanna Gretchman working in Uruguay. But pick up, pray a letter <coughs> and read a bit more. Um, you may or may not, Roger's not feeling, was not at all well today and he's waiting for some medical help. And Diane now can tell us we sound a lot better when he spoke to her on the phone, but uh, won't be out today. So we continue to remember these people and others. This we got our prayer to these people in our prayers, please. Let's just pray for the offerings. Heavenly Father, these offerings that have been given or will be given during the day. Lord, bless them, we pray. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I won't be scripture. comes from Habakkuk. And it says, Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive bough and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the old fold, and there be no bird in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will take joy in the God of my salvation. In this picture, we list all the evidence of emptiness and despair and sorrow in the world. A fig tree not blossoming, no fruit on the vines, the olive having no produce, the fields yielding no food, the flock being cut off from the fold, there's no herd in the stalls. It was just empty. Everything is empty and dry and barren in this world. That's the picture here. And then it says, yet in the middle of the dryness and the barrenness and the emptiness of everything in this world, everything we look to in this world, we long for in this world, we need in this world, even food, amidst emptiness and barrenness, Yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Even in the midst of great sorrow and suffering, because of Christ's concrete sin and death, we can take joy in the God of our salvation. And so can we pray. Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you today grateful for the opportunity to gather as a community. We recognise that you are the Almighty, the Creator of heaven and earth, and we acknowledge your sovereignty over our lives. As we embark on this time of worship, we invite your Holy Spirit to move among us, guiding our thoughts, actions and words. Lord, we thank you for the gift of this day, and for the blessings you have poured upon us, we acknowledge that all good things come from you and we are grateful for your faithfulness. As we enter this time of worship, we ask for your presence to be among us. Fill this place with your love, peace and joy. And may your spirit touch our hearts and transform our lives. So Father, we lift up our Sunday morning worship service to you. And as we gather to praise and adore you, may our voices unite in harmony, creating a symphony of worship that is pleasing to your ears. May our songs be more than melodies, but expressions of love. May the words we sing resonate deep within our souls, drawing us closer to your heart. 
I make and what I have our first thing which is meekness and majesty Thank you. 
some of them words there we can look at today that says <coughs> about worship and what we've made. We make it about ourselves sometimes, don't we? When it's not, it's all about Jesus. So let's take to God now a time of prayer and intercessions. <laughs> So Heavenly Father, we thank you for the love of your dear beloved child. We thank you for Jesus. For your selfless friendship and care for us. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you lead us and help us understand God's will for our life. So let's pray for our church today. Thank you, Father, for the new love. And that all good gifts come from you. Thank you for the, the loved ones and the church. Thank you that you love them. With infinity and divine love. And what we pray about the church is pray for our congregation, Lord. Diane has been away for a few weeks, but we know she's getting better. Lord. We also pray for Roger today. Mm. From something he's been suffering for a few months now, and now the doctors may say it's not that, and they're waiting for out of hours medical care, as he can hardly walk today. But his prayers are with us as ours with him. We pray for anyone in the church who may be struggling with their mental health or physical needs. We ask for relief from their torment. Lift the burden. We pray for those in the congregation who may be facing financial difficulties. We ask for your provision. Ask us to help share their needs and burdens. We pray that our young children have just gone out into Sunday school. We ask that you give them wisdom, self-discipline and joy. We also pray for the young children in our community today. It's most like their summer holidays. We ask that you keep them safe over this period of time. And those who do know your word can spread it among their, their friends. We pray for our country, Lord. We pray for our government. We ask that you put on the hearts of our leaders, Lord, the, the promises that they have made, that they will keep. The promise of building a stronger Britain. But not just our country, Lord. Other countries who are running up for new elections, as we pray for Donald Trump with the attempt of assassination yesterday. Why do these things turn into violence? We should let our hearts do the talking. Let our hearts vote. Let's bring wisdom that goes beyond and natural political instincts. Raise up those wise and gifted leaders. Give them a Christian heart. And if they have a heart and heart, they will soften. We also pray for our world. 
We thank you for the promise of new heavens and the new earth. The promise of eternal salvation. Thank you that you love this world so much, Father. You gave your son to rescue people from death and hell. So raise up your church all over the world to share the gospel. So that your kingdom may come into our lives. Into the darkness. And into the fear of death. We pray for the homeless in this country, Lord. And those who are going hungry. We ask that the provisions we have, if we have plenty, let us give. And that the homeless will find shelter. If it's not a brick or building, the shelter in your life. We pray for our up and coming church meeting next week, Lord. We ask that all that is discussed, that a mutual agreement will come for the better of the church, the better of the community. We also pray for the UEC meeting on the same day. And that whatever they discuss will be for the beneficiary, beneficiary of all our churches. Pray for peace in those countries of war. And the loss of lives of the children in these wars. We ask that you come and comfort the mothers and fathers of those children. And you soften the hearts of those leaders who lead in wars. We pray for our community, Lord. Wait, wait. Then they will see our doors open. And then they will wander in and discover your word, Lord. And we pray for the football tonight. We pray that all fans will be united. The Spanish fans and the English fans. And there will be no violence at these matches. And they can sit there together in harmony. The five year old will pray for each other. Every one of us needs prayer, Lord, even if we admit it or not. Sometimes we, we forget to pray for ourselves and the circumstances, Lord. We feel embarrassed to be praying for ourselves. So we ask that you look into our own hearts in order to see what we actually need and supply that need for us, even though it will be in your own time. And we ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <coughs> We have our third team now. And it is, you are my strength when I am weak.
morning comes from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians and chapter 3. If you're reading the Church Bibles, that's on page 1160. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such confidence we have through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now, if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of his glory, transitory though it was, Will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that brought condemnation is glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was transitory came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We're not like Moses, who had put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the Old Covenant is read. It's not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. The word there was transformed. And that's what I want to talk about today, transformation. And we can see how it will work for the church as well as us. So here's a list of words. I believe these words are some of the core values of our church. Leadership. Stewardship. Evangelism. Discipleship. Missions. Worship, prayer, compassion, the Word of God, community, and transformation. They describe our basic identity, the actual DNA of the church. And we should want to see these principles operating in all our ministries within the church. They should guide our planning and decision making. They should influence the way we worship, the way we run our clubs and other activities in our church. So for instance, where we read the word community, we should be able to see evidence of people coming together, building, supporting and caring relationships. Now some of these we do better than others. But that's okay. It's a process. But by God's grace, this is what we're aiming for. This is what we should be striving for. So today I'd like to address one of those core values. Transformation. So what do you mean? Well, 
It means that when it comes to our relationship with God, we should not just be satisfied with staying as we are. We should not be content to continue year after year with the same ideas, attitudes and habits as we've always had. We should realise and believe God wants to change us. That he has the power to change us. And that he, that he is changing us. Yes, it's true. God does accept us, just as we are. But it's also true that he isn't willing to leave us, just as we are. He wants to change us, all of us. He wants to shape and strengthen our character. He wants to rework our values and priorities. He wants to give us wisdom and an insight and understanding. He wants to do, what he wants to do is make us more like Jesus Christ. Listen to these verses from Paul. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord. You see, God does not want everything to be the same. He wants to change us. He wants to change you for the better. And that process began on the day when we first turned to him. The day we first trusted in Christ. And it will continue all through our lives. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, and the new has come. And in Philippians, it says, In all my prayers for you, for all of you, I always pray with joy, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to complete completion until the day of Jesus Christ. So here, we can see that transformation. It's not just a core value of the church. It's a core value for Christian life. This is what God intends for every believer. Being a follower of Christ means that you keep learning. You keep growing. You keep changing. You see, it's a journey that will only be completed when Christ returns. And until that time, we are all works in progress. If I look back on my life, where I started to, where I am now, I would not believe I could change anymore. But then I am reminded of what Paul wrote of himself in Philippians. Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I will press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal, to win the prize for which God has called me. So I hope you see this promise of change is something wonderful, because it is. It means that we can be better than we are, and that this is not as good as it gets. Whether you're a newcomer to faith, or a mature Christian, we can go further. We can go deeper with God. You will see in Him, you will see Him do greater things in your life than you have ever seen Him do so far. I believe whatever you experience in Christian life has been so far, 
God is saying to you today, I'm just getting started. You see, the changes God wants to do to make in our lives are good ones. And we know that, don't we? But it's human nature to be apprehensive about changes. Even the positive ones. There may be things in your life that you really admit are not as they should be. Perhaps a hard attitude or resentment or a bitterness towards someone who's wounded you. You know it's wrong. And you just can't seem to get over that. Or maybe you're experiencing some healthy, unhealthy fear or anxiety. Or it could be a tendency to anger or rage that you'd like to overcome. I'm sure each of us could name something where we'd like to change in our lives. The problem is that when we recognise our need for change, we might still be reluctant to actually make that change. So what I want to talk about is not the process of change itself, but what has to come before it. The decision to change. So why does this matter? Because change is not automatic. It's not a matter of God doing everything while we just sit back and go along to the ride. Nor is it a matter of us taking matters into our own hands and trying to do it all ourselves. You see, it's a joint effort. It's between us and God. So why are we so reluctant to make even positive changes? Or well, use them? There's some benefit to, to maintaining the norm, isn't there? No matter how miserable we are, no matter how desirable the change might be. After all, there, there was a reason we went down that road in the first place. If we look at resentment as an example, it usually hurts us more than the other person. The bitterness poisons us instead of them. In fact, they might not even be aware that we nurse a grudge against them. And if it, that is so, what's the point? So why do we do it? Perhaps because hatred gives us a feeling of strength. And letting go of that hate will make us feel weak. Make us feel helpless and victimised. Perhaps because feeling hatred numbs us of the pain that's been caused to us. But also change means uncertainty. It means loss. You see, even good changes involve some kind of loss. Getting married means losing freedom as a bachelor. Getting a better job means leaving the friends at your old job. Another stumbling block to change is fear of the unknown. Or the fear of the pain involved in the process of change. And then sometimes pride gets in the way. We just don't want to admit that we need change. The last reason we, we don't like change is because we're getting a rut. Even though we know we need to change, we're not comfortable enough to actually change. There's a story in John 5, chapter 5, verses 1 to 9, in which Jesus comes across a man who is in need of healing. And we should know the question he asks. It goes like this. Sometimes later, Jesus went up to the J Jerusalem, one of the Jewish festivals. Now there in Jerusalem, 
nearly shaped guide to a pole, which in Aramaic is called Bethsida, and which is surrounded by five columns. Here, a great number of dis disabled people used to lie the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been that invalid for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him laying there and learned that he had been there in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get healed? Do you want to get well? Certainly, he invalid replied, I have no one to help me to the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up. Pick up your mat and walk. But once the man was cured, he picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was the Sabbath. Now it seems a pretty ridiculous question, doesn't it? to ask at first. Of course he wanted to get well. He had been crippled for 38 years. It was a great inconvenience to this man to be crippled. He was unable to walk, to care for himself, to earn a living, but yet this was the only life this man knew. As an invalid and a beggar, he at least knew what was expected of him. He had a place in society. He had friends there at the pool. But once he was healed, his world would change. All the things other people had done for him, he would now have to do for himself. He would have to leave the pool, leave his disabled friends. He would have to find a job, make a living, build a new life. Now all these things are trade-offs that most of us would be happy to make. So why if Christ put that question to you this morning? Do you want to be well? Now think of one thing in yourself you would like to change. Then ask yourself, do I really want the freedom from this sin? This character flaw? This destructive pattern of behaviour? Well your first response would be yes. But do you really? Because change is going to cost you. And you are going to have to count that cost. Before you begin that journey, you need to look deep into your heart and ask, why am I doing this? What's in it for me? And then, what am I going to lose if I make this change? What am I afraid, why am I afraid of? Well, at a minimum, Change is going to cost you the security of having things that stay the same. It may cost you some peace of mind. It may cost you some pride. But it will cost. As we have established, change is not free. But it is worth it. When I came to Christ, I lost my so-called friends. My family slowly distanced themselves from me. And eventually they disowned me. Saying that my family never disowned me, just disowned me for following Christ, but it was part of that equation. Now I'm not saying this is the magnitude that you're all going to have to pay. But for me, this is what I was willing to trade to follow Jesus. Was it worth it? 
but I've never been more complete in my life. And for me, what I have gained has outweighed what I have lost. I can also say with certainty that obedience would always be worth the price we pay. Let's look at what Paul says in Philippians, and this comes from the New Living Testament. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the priceless gain of knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, <coughs> so that I may have Christ. You see, knowing Christ is worthy of any cost. But still, there is a cost. And so you have a choice. You can stay just where you are, holding on to what you've known, even though it's making you miserable, even though you want something better. Or you can stay, or you can say to Christ, I want to get better. I want more of the abundant life you promised me. And I don't care what it costs. I will give you what you require. I will do what you will ask. Now this is the attitude of a true disciple. That's the attitude that God requires from us all. And when we finally come to him, giving ourselves to him as clay to the potter's hands, then he can begin to work with us. To mould us into something strong and beautiful. And he will never be the same again. We will never be the same again. Now I'd like to finish by saying this. None of us will reach perfection. Even Paul didn't claim that for himself we will struggle all our lives. We will struggle with sin and weakness. We will all know failure. But we all know victory. But someday our transformation will be complete. Someday Christ will return. And when that day comes, we will be changed. There will be no more struggle. No more weakness. No more weariness. No more sorrow or tears of regret, but only joy. For we will be like Christ, and we will be with Christ forever. And that is the word from the Lord. Amen. <coughs> we now have our last hymn. Yes. <laughs> Thank you.
this place today ask us to search our hearts for something that does need change in our lives. And we ask that you take that change, Lord, and you mould it to what you want us to be. We ask that we will walk out of this church today, Lord, as a stronger and more a better person. We ask that the things in our lives that need changing will be changed. And we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's just say the grace. May the grace of Lord Jesus, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Thank you.